Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Stacia Hickey, and I am a program manager with the American Heart Association. And uh, before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. All attendees are in listen-only mode. You may be listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane of your GoToWebinar control panel and the dial-in information will be displayed. Attendees will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. I would now like to introduce Dr. Matuza Ali, interventional cardiologist with the LSU Healthcare Network. Dr. Ali earned his medical degree in 2001 from Louisiana State University School of Medicine in New Orleans, Louisiana. He completed his residency in internal medicine at Stanford University Hospital in Stanford, California. He has also completed fellowships in cardiovascular disease and interventional cardiology at Boston University School of Medicine. Dr. Ali is an American Board of Internal Medicine certified in internal medicine, cardiovascular disease, and interventional cardiology. Dr. Ali, we are very excited to have you present today, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Stacia. I appreciate that, and hopefully everyone can hear me well. Um, we're going to spend the next 30 minutes or so talking about cholesterol guidelines and clinical applications in patients with stable ASCVD and acute coronary syndrome. And uh, as Stacia mentioned, please submit your questions as they come along, and we'll hopefully be able to address those either through the presentation or immediately thereafter. There are no disclosures related to this presentation uh, relevant to me or to the American Heart Association. So starting uh, with the first part of this is just to discuss the scope of the cholesterol guidelines. Um, the document itself addresses the practical management of patients with high cholesterol and related disorders. And the evidence for this is primarily driven by randomized controlled trials. The initial, uh, the, the guidelines in 2013 uh, covered statins, and since then there have been newer cholesterol-lowering agents such as non-statin drugs, which have been introduced to the marketplace and subjected to RCTs. These include azetamibe uh, as well as PCSK9 inhibitors, and their use is primarily limited in secondary prevention of those patients with very high risk of new ASCVD events. Most patients with without very high risk of new AC, new high risk uh, of new ASCVD events could potentially be treated with statins alone. So what we're going to cover today are the 2013 and the 2018 updated guidelines with a particular focus on those patients who are at very high risk of developing new ASCVD events. As everyone on this call is well familiar, clinical ASCVD encompasses both acute coronary syndrome within those patients with a history of myocardial infarction, as well as those with stable or unstable angina without prior MI, other coronary or other arterial revascularization events, cerebrovascular events such as stroke or TIAs, and peripheral arterial disease, including aortic aneurysm of atherosclerotic origin. The 2018 updated guidelines since then additionally define those patients at a very high risk of future ASCVD events, with uh, those patients being determined by a history of multiple prior ASCVD events, or one major plus multiple high-risk conditions. And again, we'll talk about that later in this deck about what those conditions are in terms of recognizing patients with a very high risk of future ASCVD events and the need for additional vigilance and treatment in those patients. Again, something we are all very familiar with are the various lipid-lowering agents that are available to us in, the, in our pharmacologic armamentarium. Statins, of course, are the first-line treatment for lowering LDL cholesterol levels. And the benefits from statin therapy outweigh the risks for most patients in whom such therapy is indicated. And of course, these medications are most effective when taken on a long-term basis. Azetamibe is a second-line treatment for additional LDL lowering, often prescribed in addition to a statin, and often used in patients with severe hypercholesterolemia, those with an insufficient reduction in LDL-C cholesterol levels, despite maximally tolerated statin, or those who experience side effects with statin that render them intolerant to such medications. PCSK9 inhibitors are used for high-risk patients who either have harmful reactions to statins or who have not had adequate reduction in LDL cholesterol levels despite the maximally tolerated dose 
when used in addition with azetamibe. And other agents such as vibrates, niacin, and bile acid sequestrants tend to be uh, older agents that are no longer in as commonplace use. So we're gonna transition now to a discussion about patients with primary prevention. So the, the guidelines as they pertain to patients who have not yet had a ASCVD event, but are at risk for developing such events. As with all of our patients, the first line therapy, of course, is to emphasize the heart healthy lifestyle across their life course. This is at all ages, and in particular, at the younger individuals, this, such a healthy lifestyle change could potentially affect the development of risk factors, and of course, is a foundation for the, treat, for the reduction of ASCVD risk. If such agents, if such lifestyle modifications are ineffective or insufficiently effective, these are the guidelines as they pertain, again, to primary prevention. In patients who have a baseline LDL cholesterol greater than 190, even without calculating the 10-year ASCVD risk, the recommendations are to begin high-intensity statin. So these are those patients with severe primary hypercholesterolemia, LDLs greater than 190, regardless of what their calculated 10-year risk might be, the recommendation would be for to begin high-intensity statin therapy. And if the LDL remains elevated at greater than 100 despite such high intensity statin, the addition of ezetimibe is reasonable. If the LDL on statin plus ezetimibe remains elevated, and there are multiple factors that would subsequently increase risk of ASCVD events, a PCSD9 inhibitor could be considered in those patients, although the, both the safety and economic value of such uh, therapy, the PCSD9 inhibitor, is not necessarily clear at this time, at the time that the guidelines were written. So again, primary hypercholesterolemia, LDL greater than 190, regardless of ASCVD risk, statin, if that's not sufficient, azetamibe, and if that's not sufficient, then consider the addition of PCSK9 inhibitors. Likewise, in patients who are older the age of 40 and have diabetes and a baseline LDL greater than 70, the initiation of moderate intensity statin therapy, even without a calculated 10-year ASCVD risk, is appropriate. In those patients who are at particularly higher risk, such as multiple risk factors or over the age of 50, it's reasonable to use a high intensity statin with an aim to reduce the LDL level by greater than 50%. In patients who have are over the age of 40 to 75, those patients should have a clinician and patient risk benefit discussion regarding the initiation of statin therapy which would include a review of major risk factors such as cigarette smoking, elevated blood pressure, the baseline cholesterol itself, A1C if indicated, and the calculated 10-year risk. So these are patients who are 40 to 75 years of age, do not have diabetes, and are being evaluated for primary ASCVD prevention. A risk factor discussion, a risk benefit discussion should be undertaken with such patients. And the presence of risk enhancing factors do favor the potential benefits of lifestyle and statin therapies as well as, um, and the other elements in such a discussion, of course, would be the discussion of adverse side effects, drug-drug interactions, consideration of cost, and of course, patient preferences and values in shared decision-making. In those patients age 40 to 75 without diabetes and with LDL greater than 70, who are at moderate risk of ASCVD greater than 7.5%, the initiation of moderate intensity statin is appropriate if a discussion of treatment options favors statin therapy. That discussion would include a discussion of any risk enhancing factors that the patient may suffer, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. And if there are no clear cut risk enhancing factors to favor the use of statin therapy, then the use of coronary artery calcium scoring may be relevant in terms of helping to guide the need for additional therapy such as with statins. If after that discussion, either based on the use of risk enhancing factors or the presence of coronary, elevated coronary calcium artery scores, if statins are indicated, the goal LDL reduction should be 30%. And if the 10 year risk is significantly elevated, greater than 20%, then the goal LDL reduction should be less than, should be in addition to 50% reduction. This is a busy slide and it talks about those factors, the risk enhancing factors that were covered on the previous slide. So just to go through this briefly, this again applies to patients 40 to 75 years of age without diabetes, intermediate risk based on a 10 year calculated ASCVD risk, 
a discussion of elevated risk factors would, would or drive one to a greater use of statin therapy. If patients have a family history of premature ASCVD, persistently elevated LDL levels, history of metabolic syndrome, chronic kidney disease, preeclampsia or premature menopause under the age of 40, any chronic inflammatory conditions, high risk ethnicity, or persistent elevation of triglycerides despite lifestyle modification. Additionally, elevated apolipoprotein B, elevated high risk, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, depressed ankle brachial index as a marker of peripheral arterial disease, or elevated lipoprotein little a levels should all drive decision-making towards statin therapy if such uh, is consistent with the patient's decision-making and, and preferences. In patients who are at borderline risk, five to 7.5, 10 year an, annualized risk, the addition of such risk-enhancing factors may also drive patients to, to where being recommended for statin therapy. So for primary prevention, in the absence of diabetes, intermediate risk, the use of such risk-enhancing factors should help drive guide decisions about the use of statin therapy in these patients. Again, in this, this patient cohort, 40 to 75 without diabetes and with elevated LDL levels above 70, and at intermediate risk with a 10-year ASCVD of 7.5 to 19.9%, if the decision about statin therapy is uncertain, even despite the use of risk-enhancing factors, then the use of coronary artery calcium scoring would help drive some of the decision-making here. If the coronary artery calcium score is zero, statin therapy may be withheld or delayed, except in cigarette smokers, diabetes, or strong family history of ASCVD, which would, so this might apply to many of our patients. If the coronary calcium score is less than 100, but greater than zero, the guidelines recommend favoring statin therapy, particularly if the patient is advanced, uh, is beyond the age of 55. And for any patient, if the coronary calcium score is greater than 100 Addison's units or greater than the 75th percentile, statin therapy is indicated unless deferred by the clinical clinician patient risk discussion, as was recommended earlier. After initiation of statin therapy, adherence and percent uh, adherence uh, and successful adherence to such therapy. LDL measurements should be repeated at four to 12 weeks after statin initiation or dose adjustment and repeated every three to 12 months as needed. In patients who are at elevated, very high risk, triggers for additional non-statin therapy are defined by the threshold levels of greater than 70% on maximal therapy. So if patients are found to be at very high risk, as we'll talk about toward the end of this presentation, this, and, and have an LDL greater than 70 despite maximally tolerated statin therapy, additional agents such as azetamibe and PCSK9 should be considered for those patients. Transitioning now to patients who are being treated for secondary prevention for ASCVD who have already had one ASCVD event or diagnosis in the past. Guideline recommendations from 2018 in this patient population is that in those who are under the age of 75 and have clinical atherosclerotic disease, high intensity statin should be initiated and continued with an aim of a 50% or greater reduction in LDL level. For those patients in whom high intensity statin is contraindicated or experience statin associated side effects, moderate intensity therapy can be initiated and continued with a goal of 30 to 49% reduction in LDL. In patients with clinical atherosclerotic disease who are judged to be very high risk and considered for PCSK9 inhibitor therapy, such therapy should already include maximally tolerated statin therapy and azetamibe. So PCSK9 therapy follows the use of maximally tolerated statin therapy and the addition of azetamibe therapy also, and would be reserved for patients who are at very high risk and do not have sufficient response to statin and azetamibe therapy. It is reasonable to add a PCSK9 inhibitor in such patients following a clinical patient discussion about the net benefit, safety, and cost. In patients with clinical ASCVD on maximally tolerated statin therapy, judged to be at elevated risk with an elevated LDL level despite maximally tolerated therapy, the first line, the, the second line addition after statin therapy would be to add azetamibe therapy 
And this is in, prime, in part because at mid-2018 list prices, the, the value judgment on PCSK9 inhibitors was unclear at that time period. In patients over the age of 75, with clinical ASCVD, it is reasonable to initiate moderate or high intensity statin therapy after evaluation of potential risk reduction, adverse events, or drug drug interaction, as well, of course, as patient frailty and preferences. So, the, the benefit of statin therapy in patients older than the age of 75 becomes a little bit less clear, and it's reasonable to initiate moderate or high intensity therapy in a discussion with the patient. In patients over the age of 75 who are tolerating high intensity therapy, it is reasonable to continue such therapy, again, after accounting for the benefit of risk reduction, the potential adverse effects, drug drug interaction, and patient specific factors. So it is appropriate to initiate moderate or high intensity therapy, and it is appropriate to continue high intensity therapy in those patients who are already tolerating such therapy. In patients with clinical atherosclerotic disease who are on maximally tolerated statin therapy whose LDL remains greater than 70, it is reasonable to add ezetimibe even in patients older than the age of 75. And in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, which is attributable to stable ischemic heart disease and have a reasonable life expectancy, and yet for any reason are not already on a statin therapy, clinicians may consider initiation of moderate intensity statin therapy to reduce the occurrence of ASCVD events. So coming toward the tail end of this presentation, I just wanted to go over some of the uh, features related to very high risk of, of uh, findings of future ASCVD events. If a patient has one of these major ASCVD events and presents, they are at a very high risk of a future ASCVD event. And these are the presence of recent acute coronary syndrome within the past 12 months, a history of myocardial infarction other than the ACS for which they're being seen right now, history of ischemic stroke, or symptomatic peripheral arterial disease with a history of claudication, ABIs less than 0.85, or prior revascularization or amputation. In addition, there are some high-risk conditions in the presence of Two of these would be considered uh, driving patients to a very high risk of future ASCVD events if they present with an acute coronary syndrome, if their age is greater than or equal to 65, if they suffer from heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, have a history of prior cabbage or PCI outside of the major ASCVD event, diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, active smoker, persistently elevated LDL despite statin therapy or ezetimibe, and a history of congestive heart failure. In such patients, the, the treatment algorithm looks as follows. So this is, again, the overall algorithm for the management of secondary prevention in patients with clinical ASCVD. In all patients, of course, a healthy lifestyle is recommended. Following that, a determination of whether the patient is at very high risk for future ASCVD events is the next step. And in those who are not at very high risk of ASCVD events, the age determination of greater than 75 or, or under the age of 75 is next. If the patient is under the age of 75, a high intensity statin with a goal 50% or greater reduction in LDL as a class one recommendation. And in such patients, if high intensity statin is not tolerated, moderate intensity statin can be used, followed by a determination of the success of moderate intensity statin therapy and the addition of ezetimibe as necessary. In patients who have clinical ASCVD, undertake a healthy lifestyle, are not at very high risk for future ASCVD events, and are older the age of 75, initiation of moderate or high-intensity statin therapy is reasonable, and continuation of high-intensity statin therapy in those patients already taking such medications is reasonable. And you can see the level of evidence for each of these listed there. The, of most relevance, particularly from the 2018 guidelines, are the right-hand side of this slide, which indicate that in those patients with clinical ASCVD who have undertaken a healthy lifestyle and yet remain very high risk of future ASCVD events, a class one recommendation for high intensity or maximally tolerated statin therapy comes first. If on such maximally tolerated statin therapy, the LDL remains elevated above 70, addition of azetamibe is reasonable. 
And if a PCSK9 inhibitor is considered, azetamibe should be added prior to the consideration for PCSK9 inhibitor because the randomized control data supported efficacy, do support efficacy, but not necessarily cost effectiveness. If on clinically judged maximal LDL lowering therapy, including the maximally tolerated statin, addition of azetamibe, the LDL continues to be elevated, the addition of PCSK9 inhibitors is reasonable in such patients. So the take home slide really from this presentation is this one, which helps us to determine what to do in secondary prevention patients who are either at very high risk or not at very high risk for recurrent ASCVD events based on the, the two tables that I showed immediately before this. Just a final word about implementation of, such, of these recommendations. Interventions focused on improving adherence to so the therapies are obviously recommended for all patients and such, such interventions could include telephone reminders, calendar reminders, multidisciplinary education activities, or pharmacist-led interventions such as simplification of pharmacology uh, regimens. The guideline writing committee put, recommended that clinicians, health systems, and health plans should identify patients who are not receiving guideline recommended therapy and should facilitate initiation of appropriate guideline directed therapy using multifaceted strategies. And prior to the initiation of any therapy, a patient and clinician discussion should take place to promote shared decision making, including the discussion about potential for future ASCVD risk reduction, adverse events, drug drug interaction, and of course, patient preferences. So with that, I will thank you for your time and I will open it up to questions from anybody in the group. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, we appreciate your presentation. Uh, we're now going to begin answering questions submitted during today's uh, presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. And um, I see we have a question already and it states, um, Dr. Ali, for clients already under treatment, when is an LDL low enough to cause concern? And can a very high LDL, HDL ever be a cause for concern? Yeah, great questions. I think um, there are no data to my awareness that, that raise any concern about an elevated HDL. Um, it truly does seem to be a good cholesterol and any, any number is not high enough. I think we would all love to have very high LDL, HDL levels if we could. The, Question, the, the part of the question about how low an LDL becomes unsafe is an interesting one um, in that we don't seem to necessarily have an answer on this and we don't have data that strongly support the idea that any number would be too low. There are some concerns related to PCSK9 use, uh, inhibitor use that the LDL lowering might affect uh, cognitive functioning and, and, and have neurologic consequences. And the data, to, to the best of my awareness on this, do not support any clinically relevant outcomes from an LDL that is too low. Um, certainly, if you look at neonates and newborns, uh, they have very low LDL levels and they seem to do just fine in terms of their, their brain functioning and development. And so um, I think the best, guy, the best data that we have at this time on this would suggest that there is no number too low for an LDL, um, although I think the data are not fully out on that particular question. That, that's more a matter of uh, that, what I just said there was maybe more editorial than, than uh, anything else. All right, um, next question we have says, how should I approach a PCP not wanting to start a patient with diabetes within 40 to 75 years of age on a statin because LDL is um, less than, I believe it's less than 70. So a, a patient 40 to 75 with or without diabetes with an LDL lower than 70 may not need statin therapy if the LDL is lower than 70. Now, if they're- I'm sorry, I'm sorry, greater than 70, Dr. Ali, my, my apologies. So over than 70, I think therein lies the rub, which is, we know that the data support the use of statin therapy in diabetics with LDLs greater than 70, regardless of whether they've had a primary event or not. I think if there is resistance to the initiation of such therapy, um, 
where it, it falls more in the realm of discussion amongst ourselves as peers to, to recommend and explain our reasoning for why. And then of course, explaining to the patient, perhaps through the use of ASCVD risk calculators, uh, review of guidelines such as these, any of the medical calculators that are available to us through our, our smartphones, et cetera, to indicate to them uh, you know, the, the need for additional, or the need for statin therapy to reduce ASCVD risk. Now, the, the guidelines don't particularly use uh, coronary artery calcium scoring in diabetics as a tool for decision making. Um, and I don't, I, I would be stepping out of line here a little bit to suggest that in terms of uh, guideline recommendations. But I think what the, the questioner is raising is an important point about how do we build consensus and support around the idea that diabetics with LDLs greater than 70 are essentially ASCVD equivalent or, or similar to ASCVD patients and in need of lower of reduction in their, in their LDL for that reason. So I think you know, pay, physician to physician or, or provider to provider discussions as well as um, patient education about what their risk is and how they could potentially reduce that risk. Okay, and the next question in, question is, is there a provider tool to manage the intensive statin recommendations? The, I, I can't link to one specifically, both uh, you know, the American Heart Association and other professional societies have a number of online resources through their portals and their app, apps, their, their smartphone apps, for the use of medical calculators for such, um, for such purposes. I don't know the name of it off the top of my head, but um, you know, I, would, I would refer the, the question writer to um, those uh, smartphone apps from the professional societies. Yes, and, and also, Dr. Ali, I can say that we do have a, a cholesterol treatment guide uh, that the uh, American Heart Association published uh, that you can find on our website. We have a lot of tools for primary care providers on the primary prevention side, as well as some tools and algorithm for uh, the primary prevention of uh, ASCVD events for those who are very high risk. And then um, the next question that we have uh, is the best diet recommendation still Mediterranean or moving towards plant-based? You know, I think um, that, that's a great question and one that I, I don't, uh, again, not, not with the clear cut data to recommend one over the other. I think what we would probably all tell our patients is plant-based and small portion and avoidance of high processed, high glycemic, high fat content foods are probably the best uh, recommendation that we have. I sort of facetiously tell my patients, if it tastes good, don't eat it. That, that's obviously a facetious recommendation and not one that's to be taken literally, but it starts a discussion with my patients about the avoidance of high sugar, high fat, processed, um, canned, et cetera, foods and, and portion control um, I think the uh, the recommendations from probably support any of those, but don't have direct data comparing one diet over another in a meaningful sort of way. Thank you. Next question um, we have is, oh, I'm sorry, I think the question was cut off. Um, in a patient with CAD and uh, chronic kidney disease with a GFR of 51, is high statin contraindicated? No, not to my not to my uh, sensitivity sensibilities. I think um, in somebody who has atherosclerotic disease, I think a high a high intensity statin is appropriate unless there is a symptomatic or laboratory. Um, indication that they're not tolerating such a statin uh, in terms of development of myositis or, or myalgia, et cetera, um, or worst case, rhabdomyolysis. So in my mind, if someone is at, um, it has diagnosed ASCVD, either from an acute coronary syndrome or even from stable angina, uh, the use of high intensity statins is first line. It's reasonable to try something less intense if they're not able to tolerate that, but, uh, but I think the use of um, high intensity statin should be our default position in patients with known atherosclerotic disease. Uh, 
All right, in our, uh, the next question, Dr. Ali says, in our stroke program, we treat all patients post-stroke with a statin if the patient has an LDL of, <clears throat> excuse me, greater than 70, is there a recommended statin? No, the, the recommendation is for high intensity statin. So atorvastatin, rosuvastatin at specific doses. And again, one can look that up. It's, it's atorvastatin and, uh, at 40 and 80 and rosuvastatin, I believe at 20 and 40. Um, but it's a high intensity statin um, more so than a specific recommendation for one particular agent. And that has to do with the, the agent and the dose uh, in combination to determine the high intensity. Okay, great. I don't um, see any other questions in our uh, questions pane at this time. Um, if you have another question, I'll give you a couple seconds to finish typing that in. And uh, while you're doing that, just to let everyone know, if you look on your GoToWebinar um, attendee panel, you'll see um, close to the bottom, there is a, a line that says uh, handouts. And we have uploaded today's uh, slides, a PDF of today's slides. Uh, that you can um, access uh, at the hand in the handout pane on your GoToWebinar control panel. And Dr. Ali, I don't see um, any additional questions at this time. And so I want to thank you, Dr. Ali, and I want to thank uh, everyone today for attending today's webinar. Um, it was a short webinar, but uh, a nice and uh, quick breakdown of the cholesterol guidelines and um, we hope that you uh, in, found it very uh, helpful. And please uh, remember you will receive a follow-up email with the link to view today's recording, as well as a survey to provide us with your feedback. Um, so in the future, we can continue to uh, make our uh, educational events as uh, helpful and effective uh, as possible. And um, with that, on behalf of the American Heart Association and our presenter, Dr. Ali, thank you for joining us today and have a great day. Thank you.